Hello, I'm Paul Pirello, and welcome to the Philly Factor. Well, it, make no mistake about it, Philadelphia is definitely a restaurant town. A number of years ago, we went through this tremendous restaurant renaissance, and no matter whether you live here, you visit here, you're from the other side of the country, or even the other side of the world for that matter, if you're coming to Philadelphia, you are almost guaranteed to have a great meal, no matter where you go, whether it's in South Philly, North Philly, West Philly, the suburbs, South Jersey, you are going to have a great meal. My guest knows a few things, should I say many things, about our region and what makes it so unique when it comes to those eats and sweets around town. Uh, so much so that Irene Levy Baker has written a book about it. Unique Eats and Eateries of Philadelphia breaks down 90 of the region's best culinary spots, whether it's DeBruno Brothers in the Italian market or Sabrina's Cafe. Irene not only highlights 90 of the area's restaurants, but she also shares with us some uh, tips on maybe getting that very hard to get uh, reservation. Irene, welcome back to the program. I'm so happy to be here again, Paul. Thank you. I love the book, just like your first book. Thank you. Um, and when we had you here back in 2016, I think it was, yes. to talk about the first book, um, I was sort of probing, might there be a second book? And lo and behold, here you are with your second book. So um, 90 places, sort of an odd number, I mean, because there are more than 90 places around town. So Why 90? This book tells the stories, the sweet and savory stories behind 90 Philadelphia restaurants. And in order to get in the book, you had to have a good story and good food. Mm -hmm. And there's tons of tips, as you mentioned. Yeah. 90 was the format that the publisher set up. But as you mentioned, we have such a great restaurant communi community that the hardest part of the book was picking just 90. Mm. So I cheated. <laughs> the book actually mentions 254 restaurants. Okay. Yes, I counted. Mm -hmm. um, I cheated by putting in lists of all the things people ask me, like a list of vegetarian restaurants, a list of vegan restaurants, a list of gluten-free restaurants, um, lists of great places for brunch, and lists of places to have private dining rooms or you know group dinners. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, when it comes to, and I said at the beginning here, that no matter where you go, you are going to find maybe more of the established restaurants that have been there forever, and then there are these new restaurants that have popped up, it seems like, on every street corner, not to minimize just how good they are, but uh, you are almost guaranteed, no matter what you're looking for, whether it's Italian, whether it is Vietnamese, whether it is vegan, whatever it is, wherever you go, you are pretty much guaranteed to have a very good meal in Philadelphia. Um, definitely. I mean, we're finally, Philadelphia is finally getting the recognition it deserves for its amazing restaurants. Mm -hmm. You know, national publications are starting to call us a great food city. We're getting James Beard's awards to our chefs and restaurateurs. So we're definitely starting to get recognition. And in the book, I include all kinds of restaurants. I include restaurants in the city as well as in the suburbs in South Jersey. Mm -hmm. I include high-end restaurants as well as fast casual restaurants. When did Philadelphia, I mean, because, as you could tell, there hasn't been a meal that I haven't passed up because <laughs> I love to eat, not breaking any stories here, but a fact of the matter is, when did we start to undergo and go through this restaurant renaissance? Because, look, no matter where I go, whether it's in my part of the city down in South Philadelphia or I travel outside of my comfort zone, there's always, but so when did we start going through this restaurant renaissance? I feel like we went through the restaurant renaissance when Ed Rendell was mayor and he started allow, and things started happening. He started pushing tourism. He understood that that brought people and money and helped the economy. Um, there were, started to be sidewalk cafes for the first time. But I think our restaurant history goes back to William Penn. Mm. Um, William Penn welcomed, when he founded Philadelphia, he welcomed people of all nationalities and, and religions. And as a result, Philadelphia is a real melting pot. Mm -hmm. And that brought different people, different cultures, different cuisines. Yeah. When, um, when we think of restaurants, we think of those traditional eateries that might have um, 20, 30 tables. And then there are a number of places around town that are very intimate in, in their setting, where you may, it may be like on the corner of some side street in you know um, Kensington or Maniunk or wherever you go, so how how would a person know that 
Um, this is a good restaurant. I mean, generally speaking, obviously, we want them to pick up the book, and we're going to tell you about a special offer Irene is making uh, for the viewers of this program. But how would I know that when I walk through the door of that establishment that I'm going to get what all the hype is perhaps behind that restaurant? So um, I like to say I'm not a food critic. In the book, I talk about the story behind the restaurant, whether it's a restaurant that's been passed down through generations, mm -hmm. whether it's a place where there was a failed mob hit, or whether there's a love story. Mm -hmm. um, but I am a food detective. And in order to get into the book, you had to have two things, a good story right. and good food. Right. And in each case, it tells what kind of food and what kind of cuisine the restaurant has. So readers can make their own decision about what appeals to them and where they want to go. So in that case of the restaurant where there was a mob hit, yes. but the food is great, how cooperative were they when you came to sort of research that restaurant? Let me tell you that story. One of the tips in the book is where you can spot celebrities. Okay. And one of those places is Dante and Luigi's mm -hmm. in South Philadelphia. Right. And it was almost 20 years ago. Wow. On Halloween night, I remember it. Yeah. Nicoderm Scarfo was having dinner there. He had just inherited the family mob business from his father, little Nicky, who couldn't do it anymore because he was in prison for the next 60 years. Mm -hmm. Nicoderm was having dinner, and in walked a man dressed like Batman. And he pulled a gun out of his trick or treat bag and shot Nicky, Nicoderm six times. Mm. Right, you look concerned, but it's okay because <laughs> Nicoderm survived. Yeah. He wasn't that lucky, though, because he landed in prison for the next 30 years. Mm. Now, in the meantime, the restaurant's also been a survivor, and instead of attracting the infamous, now it's attracting the famous. Joe Biden has a house account there. Taylor Swift ate there recently and left a $200 tip. Wow. And John Travolta was there recently with his wife, Kelly Preston, mm -hmm. ironically promoting their new movie, Gotti. Gotti. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, I know. Yeah. Um, and, and, and also, did the management change there too? Yes, Perhaps the management we'll changed. It's been totally renovated, but one thing that has not changed is that they serve great, you know, red gravy, tra red gravy traditional Italian food. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so when you took on this challenge of writing this book, it came off your previous uh, successful book, 100 Places to... 100 Things to Do in Philadelphia Before You Die. Right, exactly. So uh, how do you dive into this? Do you reach out to these restaurants and these eateries? Uh, or do you send them an email? Just give me a little bit of how you reached out to these places and say, hey, this is the book that I'm doing, would be interested to include you in this, but based on your criteria. So how did you reach out to them? No but. I reached out to chefs and restaurateurs who I felt had an interesting story or who I thought I wanted to include in the book and I had to find their story um, and set up time to talk with them. Mm -hmm. And most of the chefs were very forthcoming, um, willing to share their stories and happy to share their stories. And I'm thrilled to be able to share them with you. Yeah, and, and that was the other question. The follow-up question is how eager or receptive were they to the request? Because I suspect, not that you're asking them to share any recipes that might give the competition, you know, the insight as to how, oh, how do they make that? <laughs> but that's not, the, that's not the, the purpose of this book. But uh, so they were all on board with this. They were pretty receptive to the idea. Um, yeah, some took a little more persuading than others. Mm -hmm. um, but when you eat in a restaurant where you know the story, it makes it a little more special. If you know, if you're eating at Vernick, which is a great restaurant, Greg Vernick's place, mm -hmm. he just won a James Beard Award, um, and you know why the picture of his grandfather's hanging next to the kitchen, mm -hmm. or you're eating at Grand Cafe L'Aquila and you know about the secret menu items because you read about them in the book, I think that makes your dinner a little more special. Yeah, for sure. What, um, you know, everybody asks the question, how do I get a reservation at, and you can fill in the blanks. Yes, so, everybody, uh, everybody asks me that question. Yeah. Vernick, Veg, Zahav, it's, people ask me all the time how to get reservations. Yeah, so how do you get so, the reservation? In the book, I list 10 tips for getting reservations at Philadelphia's trendiest restaurants. Mm -hmm. All of them are super simple. None of them involve anything awkward like tipping the maitre d'. Mm -hmm. And they're all, anyone can do, anyone can do them. You don't have to know the chef or the restaurateur. And I'll share a couple of them with you sure, today. Go ahead. Okay. So um, we all go to open table first, mm -hmm. and sometimes you'll find there's nothing between 5 and 9.45. And what people don't know is that restaurants pay open table for every res reservation that comes in that way. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they don't list every reservation slot on open table. So simply picking up the phone and calling, sometimes you can find reservations that don't exist on open table. That's not all the reservations available. Mm -hmm. If you call and they still don't have a reservation, ask them to take walk-ins. 
uh, Veg, for instance, holds a certain number of tables every night for walk-ins. Okay. And what I recommend to people is, if you live in Center City, walk in at 6 o'clock if they don't have a table. Go up 13th Street to Midtown Village where there are two dozen other fabulous restaurants to mm -hmm. eat at. If you're coming in from the suburbs, that doesn't work so well. You want to have a plan. Sure. So I say make reservations somewhere at 7 o'clock. Walk into Veg at 6 o'clock. If you get a table, cancel your 7 o'clock reservations. And if you don't, you have a backup plan. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, great tips. And, and many of these tips, all of these tips are outlined in the book. I do want to mention the special offer because I want to mention the website where people could go and uh, find out not only more information about the book, but you have an offer. If you go to uniqueeatsphilly.com, mm -hmm. you could purchase the book there, and Irene has been gracious to uh, have a special offer for our viewers. Sure, if people want to get it at my website, uniqueeatsphilly.com, and they tell me they heard about it on this show, I'll sign it for them. There you go. The book is also available on Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, and at independent bookstores. So given your background, and when you were here to discuss your first book, um, you worked with the uh, Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. For many years I did, for yes. For many years. You also have your own public relations firm, Spotlight PR, which deals with a lot of restaurants, and hospitality, and yep. hospitality. Mm -hmm. Hospitality being your, you know, your work with the Convention and Visitors Bureau. So, was it? Were you able to cultivate those contacts through the uh, CVB and the hospitality industry to help you in your mission here with this book? So, a lot of the tips and stories um, in the books are things I learned over the years working at the Convention and Visitors Bureau, working with chefs working with restaurateurs, working with food writers and diners, and mm -hmm. things I've accumulated over the years. Yeah. Sure. Um, is there a particular a trend that you see now, Irene, when it comes to restaurants? Because we still have those established traditional restaurants, but there are a lot of new eateries that are popping up. So from your perspective, what seems to be the trend as we move into the new year and, and just on the restaurant scene in general in the Philadelphia region? Um, Philadelphia uh, diners have gotten much more adventurous, mm. so that's super fun for the chefs, and they can try new things, new ingredients, um, be a little more out there. Mm -hmm. And also, but right now, I think the most exciting place to be eating is Fishtown. Mm. Um, some of the restaurants, like Soraya, a Lebanese restaurant that just opened, Chew Fishtown, William Mulherin and Sons. Um, uh, there's just so many exciting restaurants right now in Fishtown. Yeah, and yet, uh, you know, people that live in Fishtown are familiar with Fishtown, but there might be some people clear across, let's say, the suburbs that say, well, you know, I really don't want to venture into the city, you know, the big city, the big, you know, uh, you know, uh, big city out there where I'm not sure if they're going to have parking, do they have valet parking, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to find the restaurant, but um, you have found that many of the owners and the uh, maitre d's and the people, you know, the wait staff are very easy and accommodating when it comes to helping to get diners to get into the front door. Sure, of course. Yeah, and that's so important because if the wait staff isn't up to par, if the owner doesn't, and the other thing that, you know, just talking about owners and what I have witnessed is the Philadelphia Naval Yard. What was the Philadelphia Navy Yard? There have been a number of eateries pop up there and yet we don't necessarily think of the Navy Yard as a place where there would be restaurants that you could go and eat today. Yeah, it's a really interesting place. There's an Ami down there. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, even Mercer the Cafe, eatery, yeah, yeah, and the eatery at Urban is mm -hmm. really interesting and beautiful. And yeah, there's a lot of places to eat down there. Yeah, everybody thinks of it as, you know, what was at one time a shipyard. They were building ships there, also a naval installation, and having just traveled I hate to say this, I've lived in South Philadelphia my entire life. I never went beyond um, Broad and Patterson down Broad Street because we just thought it was the Navy Yard. But went down there to see this recent art installation and was amazed at what is going on at what was the former Naval Shipyard. Now there's still a Navy component there right. at the shipyard, but it is a bustling, thriving part of the city that not many people, maybe it's the best kept secret, but uh, you know, many of these restaurants are thriving and surviving down there. And uh, you'd be surprised if you just venture a little bit out of your comfort zone to find uh, find some of these restaurants. Sure. Now, now you don't have to go too far out of your comfort zone because no, there I is don't. some great dining in Sa in South Philadelphia, yeah. especially along East Pashunk. Yeah, uh, that has really uh, you know at one time, and I remember when I was a student here at LaSalle, that Pashunk Avenue was sort of you know down and out. It looked like it was just going to like wither away to nothing, and it really has experienced a tremendous 
uh, rebirth there, and there seems like there are more restaurants than there are people sometimes on Pashog <laughs> Avenue. But that's good. I mean, that's good for business because yeah, it it, it's not just all Italian food, but it's got an eclectic blend of food along Pashog Avenue. Right. I mean, I love uh, Bing Bing Dim Sum. Mm -hmm. There's uh, Satay Kampar, which is Malaysian. I mean, you'll find all different kinds of things. Um, one of my favorites is sort of a sleeper, which is Miss, Mr. Martino's. Mm. Uh, Trattoria, which has been there for 27 years, and wow. all these other hip new restaurants have grown up around it. Mm -hmm. And it's just um, uh, Mark and Marie run it themselves. He runs the front of the house, she's in the back of the house at a six kitchen burner all by herself. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, dinner's not fast. You go in, and as soon as, Marie, as quickly as Marie can get it out, she does, but you can't expect to run in and run out. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but it's all homemade, mm -hmm. it's all delicious. And uh, it's, it's, it's quirky, you know, like if you call for a reservation and you leave a message when you want to come in, if you don't hear back, you're good. If they don't have availability, they'll call you. Really? Yeah. It's sort of the opposite yeah. of what you would think, right? It's yeah. a little BYOB, and it's one of the few books, one of the few people that asked not to be in the book. Really? Yes. Uh, Mark was afraid that people wouldn't get it, that they would expect too much. I mean, it's so small that if they go on vacation, they close. Mm -hmm. That's unusual yeah. today. Yeah. So, um, but I was so enamored with the restaurant that I went home to my office and I wrote it up anyway. And I sent it to Mark and I said, listen, if you don't want to be in the book, I don't want to make anyone unhappy. Mm -hmm. But I so loved your restaurant. Just look at what I wrote. And after he read it, he uh, said, okay, we'll be in your book. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's great. It says yeah. a lot about you and your ability to not only convince people that you need to be in the book, but your ability to um, realize a good story and work that story and include it uh, in your book. Uh, was there anything that really stood out? I mean, when you went through at least these 90 different places and you did your research and you did your homework, was there anything of all these stories that really stuck out as like, wow, I didn't know that, or I've passed this place a dozen times during the week. I didn't know what the history was of this place. Oh, that happened over and over again. Mm -hmm. Can I share some of my favorites sure. with yeah. you? So John and Kira's chocolate. Mm -hmm. They make the ladybugs and the bumblebees. You'll see them at De Bruno Brothers. You'll see them at farmers markets. Mm -hmm. And I thought their story was that they, which is, is that they buy mint seeds. They give them to area high schools. The high school students grow the mints and spices. Mm -hmm. They buy it back. They use it in their chocolate, and then they give some of the proceeds to the high schools. Okay. And that's a good story. Yeah. But as I talked to them, the story got even better. The first month they opened. Gourmet Magazine put them on the cover of the Valentine's Day issue and called them the best chocolate in the country. Wow. And the fact checker called John and said, are you guys married? And John said, no, but leave it in the story. And when the first issue came out, he handed it to Kira across the dinner table with a diamond ring taped inside. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, that, those are sweet sweets, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it was discovering stories like that mm -hmm. that were so exciting. Yeah, yeah. When, um, when people um, pick up your book, what should they expect from the book? I mean, it's, it's not a recipe book, you're not sharing recipes, but you're really sharing the, you know, the inside story to many of these restaurants. You're offering tips and advice and all that too, but we really learn about some of these restaurants, not only in the city, but across our region. Yes, that's true. And, yeah. uh, and there are tips like secret menu items. At Grand Cafe Laquila, you can get a, um, you don't have to decide what kind of gelato to have. You can get a vertical gelato tasting with five different kinds of gelato. But you can only get it if you know, because it's not on the menu. Wow. Even Wawa has a secret menu. Did you know that? I did not know that. Really? If you know where to touch on the iPad, you can get their secret menu when you hmm. order. Are you going to tell us where, where that is on the iPad? Sure. I'll tell you. It's on page 62 of the book. <laughs> You got to get the book. <laughs> she's telling us, but she's not really telling us. But um, again, the book, I mean, I've, I've been reading a lot of the reviews of the book, and it is really something that, look, if you're looking for a book, a gift at this time of year, you definitely want to get this book. And if you go to uniqueeatsphilly.com, uh, I mentioned that you saw Irene on the Philly Factor. When you purchase the book, she will personalize uh, the book when she sends it out to you. Um, the, it seems to me 
that this has got the makings of book two, book three. <laughs> Not that I want to put any pressure on her. Last time she was here, 2016, she, you know, when she was talking about her first book, she said, uh, yeah, you know, uh, who knows if there will be another book, and lo and behold, there's a, she's working on the second book, and here it is. But, you know, come on, you just scratch the surface, Irene, with the, with the restaurants and eateries in our town. Just to be consistent, I'm going to say, who knows if there's another book. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, what, um, when, when we talk about um, restaurants, and we can't, we, we talked about the traditional restaurants, Reading Terminal Market. I mean, talk about a conglomeration of so many different places under one roof. Uh, it's a traditional place. I mean, every politician, whatever they're running for, has either got to go to Reading Terminal Market, and they're also making a stop at Pat's and, Pat's and Gino's, Gino's, of course. Too. Yeah, for sure. But okay, let's talk about Reading Terminal Market here. So, um, is it included in the book? Of course. Yeah. Both books. Yeah. And so, what's so unique about them? Are there places that we should? Um, look for, we're going to Reading Terminal Market, whether it's for the first time or we're looking to get uh, holiday shopping done for, you know, for the dinner table. Sure. Okay. I want to back up a second and then we'll talk about Reading Terminal okay. Market. Um, you had mentioned what was coming up next mm -hmm. and the restaurant scene is changing frequently. Mm -hmm. So I do have very active social media channels where okay. people can hear about new restaurants opening, see pictures of new dishes, hear about things happening in the hospitality industry. Mm -hmm. And that is on Facebook and Instagram, it's 100 Things to Do in Philadelphia. And on Twitter, it's 100 Philly. Okay. So anything new coming out restaurant-wise or if uh, there does end up being another book, that'll be all on uh, those social media channels. Okay. It's Reading Terminal Market. Okay. So the fun of Reading Terminal Market, I think, is discovering new places. And the combination of prepared foods from different nationalities and, and Philadelphia foods, and also, um, you know, you can do your grocery shopping there, mm -hmm. which is always an adventure. Yep, yep. You know, whether you want fish or meat or lamb or produce uh, or bulk nuts, it's all there, um, which is great. Mm -hmm. And there are several places in the book, besides Reading Terminal Market, there are several places that are in the market that are in the book as well, okay. like Facets Ice Cream, which mm -hmm. is the oldest um, merchant in the uh, Reading Terminal Market. Mm -hmm and Herschel's Deli. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about Herschel's Deli. Yeah, please. The sandwiches are so big, you can barely get your mouth around them. <laughs> uh, corned beef is amazing. And Herschel's is named, the owner, Stephen Saffer, named the deli after his uncle Herschel. Mm -hmm. Because his uncle Herschel was in Poland. He um, was with a big family. He heard that the Nazis were about to march into town. Mm -hmm. And uncle, and Herschel ran home, found his younger brother there, saved his younger brother, got him, left town, got to the border, um, ended up in Siberia, mm -hmm. and eventually made their way to the United States. Herschel ended up working for 40 years in a famous New York deli, mm -hmm. Katz's. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, the little brother grew up, moved to Philadelphia, and that was Stephen's father. Wow. So Stephen um, decided to open a deli. He named it after his uncle Herschel, who had saved his father during the Holocaust. Wow. Yeah, Great so it's story. really special. Yeah, wonderful story. Um, we have to talk about the Philly cheesesteak. Of we course. Talked about, we talked about Geno's and we talked about Pat's. And again, um, it seems like every politician since George Washington, all I'm kidding, has gone to the, uh, you know, to the location of Geno's and Pat's. But uh, are there some other steak shops that are included in the book that are off? Not necessarily that Tours Trap, for instance? So I do feel that Pat's and Gino's, of course, needed to be mentioned in the book for those tourists who pick it up because it's not only a sandwich, it's an experience. Yes, it is, yeah. And I always recommend to people to go there, you know, late at night when they're going to see, you know, they could see brides and grooms and they can see limousines and they can see celebrities and, you know, all kinds of people. Um, and I always let them know that the best way to eat a cheesesteak is by leaning forward so you don't drip on yourself. <laughs> Um, but it does also mention other cheesesteak places that Philadelphians in the know also like to get their cheesesteaks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, we all have a few minutes left here, and is there um, one piece of advice that you could give folks watching the program right now when it comes to the uh, eating scene in Philadelphia? What, what is it that you feel that maybe we, we miss or we don't? know what to ask or we don't know where to go or what to do. What type of advice can you give people? Wow, that's such an interesting question. Um, I, I guess the answer is to not be afraid to explore different neighborhoods, 
different kinds of foods, to try new things, um, but make every calorie count. Mm -hmm. um, you know, n there's never any reason to have a bad meal, and um, so, you know, go for it. Yeah. Uh, do you find that, uh, do restaurants appreciate when people put online reviews? Uh, because <laughs> I have I'm, a very strong opinion about okay, that. Okay, go ahead. So, if you have a bad experience, say you're not clicking with the waiter or something, okay. or your food is cold, you can have a bad meal and eat your cold dinner and go home and write about it on Yelp, mm -hmm. or you can mention it to the owner or the manager whose job it is to make you happy and who really want to make you happy, mm -hmm. and they can fix it yeah. by either bringing you something you like better um, or heating up your meal, and then you can have a great evening. Mm -hmm and then you don't have to go home and complain about it. Yeah. So it's your choice, have a great meal or suffer through a lousy one and then complain about it. Yeah. Your choice. Yeah, for sure. Well, I want to mention the website once again. It is uniquephillyeats.com. That's where you can find out all the information about Irene's book. If you also purchase the book through the website, Irene will also personalize it and uh, get it out to you. And what a pleasure it is to catch up with you again. Uh, you were here two years ago to talk about your first book. Uh, here you are talking about your second book, so maybe we should set the date now for two years from now uh, for you to come back and talk about the third book. Only kidding, but uh, you've done wonderful jobs uh, with both books. Uh, continued success, and uh, come on back and see us again. Thank you, Paul. All right. Until the next time, thank you so much for watching uh, The Philly Factor. Remember, go to Irene's uh, website, uniquephillyeats.com. Purchase the book there. She will also... Uh, uniqueeatsphilly. Uniqueeatsphilly.com. <laughs> and uh, she will personalize it and get it out to, to you. So uh, thanks so much for watching The Philly Factor. And uh, until the next time, have a great day.